what's going on guys, it's me, Train Man, and welcome back to the Zombie Train. This week we're going to be continuing our tale of running up to... Running up towards Toronto. Uh, but before then, once again, I'm going to cover what we do this episode. Now you may notice I'm putting down new baseboards, which is something I haven't done in a very long time around here. Ignore that. Uh, something I haven't done in a very long time around here, and the reason is for that is for next season, season two of the Iron Horseman Chronicles, all of the set is, uh, all of the route that we have so far is taken care of in terms of set. You know, if I, uh, have need of filling in some other sections, I will bring in some other guys to do those sections. You know, people that want to stretch their legs and try to do part of the Iron Horseman Railroad, which, you know, I wouldn't be against, but that's mostly going to be Iron Horseman taking care of that. So, Anyways, uh, right now we're going to be starting work on the Old Main. Now, from east to west, there are three different connections, and this is the third and northernmost and also oldest one. Uh, but most of this history will be covered in the series and uh, in extended fiction, which we may release some of in the future. Uh, you guys deserve a, a history of the world sort of thing, as well as a few other things. And you'll see on Saturday on the Iron Horseman channel, we're going to be releasing the first or I'm going to, personally, be releasing the first of a series of very short videos accompanied by four or five or six page stories. Uh, and these are going to be labeled the Johnson Short Stories, and they're going to cover uh, just some some basic history, some basic everything, you know, as, as if he were to make a journal. Anyways, speaking of journals... I never actually got around to writing a journal on the train, although that may have been something that... Uh, something that I wanted to do, I don't know, I passed up the opportunity plenty of times, and frankly, paper of all things was not something you wanted to go through really quickly. Uh, you know, you could get reams of the stuff, but you didn't squander it, generally. We had electricity, most of the time, thanks to uh, generators and whatnot. You know, as I told you, the generator was terribly inefficient. Uh, and that was our only way of generating any sort of decent amount of power, at least at this point, which was early 2013, you know, out into, where did, where did I say it was, you know, January, February, that's where we were. Um, I need to update the timeline to reflect this. Anyways, so it was, it was in this time, we left off, and... I was telling you guys about the battery bank, and now we're on our way to Toronto, and there wasn't really anything hugely uh, interesting that happened the rest of the way. Uh, we didn't stop and, uh, I mean, we stopped and we did a little bit of scavenging. We didn't do a lot of looting, uh, you know, there wasn't any massive finds during that period. But we got up to Toronto, and by then I had not only formulated ideas, but started to enact some plans as to what I wanted to do as for power on the train. Um, so, the first thing was the locomotive dynamo. But as you guys will probably know, dynamos on locomotives are not suited or designed to, uh, to run anything more than a handful of lights. You know, as, and so these things, you know, dynamos as they stand on locomotives don't generally output a lot of power. So, that was kind of out, and we, we used that for a couple things, we used it for, uh, we, we started, you know, not overclocking it, per se, but we started upgrading it a little bit, and we were able to eke enough voltage out of it to, to get a couple extra lights, to get uh, a little radio intercom system working, and that, that's sort of when we started uh, building up our infrastructure between the cars, uh, with, with cables and, and wires. But we we got the intercom working on very very low voltage, and that was that was from the beginning. That was from almost the very beginning. Uh, we then got the generator, which I told you guys about, and that's where we stood when we got to Toronto. Uh, in the downtime, I realized we couldn't do much without the generator running. Uh, well, we couldn't do much without ge the generator running at that point. Period. That's right. So we couldn't do much without the generator running, because we didn't have any other source of electricity, and the thing would go through fuel like nobody's business. Um, so that was kind of a, a wash, and we kept this generator, we never got rid of it, we never used it, or, well, we 
we tried not to use it. And the reason we tried not to use it is because we very quickly had a replacement. This replacement uh, was called the battery bank, and it was coupled with a very, uh, or rather, a much larger dynamo, not necessarily a very large one, but a much larger one, uh, that was hooked directly into the axle of, you know, it was it was ran from a belt which was woven, you know, it was sent through the floor of the radio room, which was the second car, and the, the second passenger car. Um, we had six. These were, uh, I'll just take a moment to, to describe here, these were towards the end. You had the war room first, which was behind the miscellaneous cars that supported the engine. Uh, the war room, then the radio room, then the lounge, then the diner. Um, war room, radio room, lounge, diner. Oh, we had seven coaches, did we? Yeah, we had seven. Uh, radio room, diner, then um, the, the bunks, followed by the hospital, followed by our auxiliary storage. Anyways, uh, and then following that was this rusty old car that we pulled out and ended up turning into a hydroponics lab with this woman that we had actually already picked up at this point. I, I kind of skipped over her. Uh, she was sort of in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts or, or up towards into Vermont. Helen Vertwixt, uh, very, very Russian woman, but she was, she was something else. She was crazy smart, and she just decided to go for hydroponics, and that's how we, that's how we ended up with a lot of our food as, as time went on. Anyways, so, the radio room, being the most electrically centered room, you know, all sorts of gear went in there, all sorts of, you know, by the end we had, uh, like, desktop computers, and all sorts of other apparatus, you know, stuff that takes a significant amount of power, not just telegraphs and radios. Um, so, the first thing was to get this dynamo running, and so we cooked this thing up. This thing was about the size of, like, a good-sized suitcase, and so we plopped this thing on the floor, cut a hole through the floor, ran this belt, uh, which was a, like an old mill belt, uh, around the, the spool of the dynamo, down through the floor of the coach, and around one of the, the axles on the truck. It was the front axle on the rear truck. Um, so that's what we did. And this thing would just generate power whenever we were moving. And that was great. Except when we stopped moving. Then it didn't generate any power. So that's when we'd kick the generator on. And that's when we would burn all the fuel. So it occurred to me, after we had this thing built, or, you know, not after we had it built, but before... Uh, it occurred to me before we had it built, but I didn't enact anything until after this first initial section was done. So we had the dynamo, we had the generator. These two worked, like, back-to-back, -back, so to speak. I decided, okay, we need something to give us power while we're not moving that isn't the generator, because we're going to burn through fuel. So I came, Emilio and I, because Emilio and I were, were students in a pre-engineering program, a robotics program, and so we had a little bit of experience with this kind of design. Um we came up with this thing called the battery bank. And this was 24, yeah, 24 uh, batteries, like car batteries, that were arranged in a 4x6 a pattern. Is that, that's 24, right? Yeah, it's 4x6, four, four so four, four rows, six columns, and they were done with these heavy-duty relays. And so the system, which, the system... Uh, would recognize, you could, you could flip it manually, but it recognized when there was a drain on the system, uh, because less power in the system would mean, because these are big relays, less power in the system would mean the magnets that are holding the relays would come undone, the relay would flip the other direction, and the system would go from charge to discharge. Simple as that. Not so simple. It caught on fire a lot. Um, but that was the battery bank, and so that that was that we did after we got back from Toronto. So now I'm completely sidetracked, but that was our power situation, and that's how it stayed uh, 
to the end of the zombie train. We had the, the dynamo, we had the generator as emergency backup, and we had the battery bank for when we were stopped. Anyways, we go all the way over top of Lake Erie. It's Lake Erie, right? The one that's right there? Now we need a map again. But we go all the way over top of Lake Erie, we make it to Toronto. When we were getting close, we started getting these transmissions. You know, we knew they were in trouble, but we started getting these more frequent, more urgent transmissions. Uh, what was the guy's name? I don't remember the name of the mayor. Whatever. I probably have it written down somewhere. Name of the mayor of Toronto, who eventually became, uh, what do they call him? He was closer to a, closer to a, to a king than a president, but he became the president of the Toronto Rail Lands, and they named themselves that because of us. So, we are coming into Toronto, and the place is completely surrounded. There are no, there are very, sorry, it was Lake Ontario. Not Lake Erie. Um, they're, they didn't, like, build any walls or anything. They just sort of dealing with it. They're, they're hanging out in the buildings and whatnot. And they're sort of, they're trying to push the zombies back, but there are too many. It's, this is a, an ordeal that went on for, uh, weeks, if not months before we got there. It was known as the Siege of Toronto. And, it wasn't even that they were getting picked off by zombies because they'd done some really smart things. You know, everyone had migrated to the second floors of buildings at least. They were working on getting stuff, like, up in between buildings so you could get from one building to the next. Um, they had destroyed most of the stairways and ladders so the zombies were having trouble getting up to them in the first place, and they were really just picking them off. But it was a siege because they didn't have the capability to get supplies especially things like ammunition. This is Canada. Uh, I'm not sure what the state of gun laws are in Canada, but needless to say, it wasn't like rolling into a city in Texas, where, you know, it's either either they've already got the zombies taken care of because everyone has all the guns and ammunition you'd ever need, or they're all wiped out anyways because nobody pulled the trigger in time. Uh or, you know, the few people that did didn't get along and fought each other. You know, it, 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 there's a lot of things that can happen in in this situation where you have a lot of survivors together. These guys had really done an amazing job of standing together. Um, and we're still managing to radio for help. They still had power. They still had a lot of things. They had fresh water. I mean, obviously, because they were on the lake, but they managed to get it pumped up to the second stories and everything. I was really impressed with the amount of infrastructure they'd made by the time we got there. But we come in, and what we do is, you know, when we did this as a sort of smash and grab, we set up guys in a yard, you know, they were concentrated towards into town. There's this, there's this yard on the outside, it's a big hump yard, and we parked the train there. And then what we did was we uncoupled everything but the engine, we had everyone get in these strategic positions with as much ammo as we could muster because we were kind of overloaded on the stuff from from the scavenging. Uh, you know, people will take people will take only as much ammo as they can carry, but there's usually a lot more ammo than that. Um, and we could carry a lot more because we had a train, obviously. So we load up with as much ammo as we could put out there, get the train out there, and then we ran the engine into town as far as we could go. We pulled into... Uh, what is this? Is this a station over here? We got we got as close to the center of town as we could go. And uh, using, uh, not the metro lines, but there are just some freight roads that run through town. And I laid on the whistle, and then I reversed all the way to the yard. And we had this entourage. I have no idea what the population of Toronto was at that point, but it was like 99% zombies. Uh, and there had to be several hundred thousand, if not a couple million zombies that were chasing us. And, you know, we didn't have a couple million bullets, but we had the ability to lead them out of town, and we took out as many as we could in the front, and then we sort of led them. You know, I, I got coupled to the train again, and we plowed through them and led them off towards Detroit. <laughs>